Hello everybody and welcome to part two of my three-part series of me talking about my final year uni project. If you don't know me, my name's Kirsty and I'm a fourth year design student at Grey School of Art. And if you've not watched the first video in this series, I would suggest that you do so because you're kind of jumping in in the middle and you're, it's not going to make most sense. I've actually filmed this video already um, and I have deleted it because I thought I talk all the nonsense in it. <laughs> so this is take two and hopefully it's going to go a lot better and also hopefully this is not going to take as long to edit as the first one did because that took far too long and I do not have the time. <laughs> at the end of the last video I was at the end of my first semester and I'd kind of completed the bulk of my research, particularly with my dissertation, which I'm also gonna do a video about. But going into semester two, my main focus was the interim show. Now the interim show at Grey School of Art is a halfway show between the start of the year and the, the degree show at the end of the year. And we all have the chance to show what we've been working on, maybe give a, give a bit of context, show some material tests, show some prototypes. It's kind of what you choose your interim show to be. And obviously that's really dependent on what your project's like. So for my project, what I thought was really important was to communicate the context I was working with. I really wanted to create a strong visual language. I personally think it's really important to present your work in a way that reflects yourself as a designer and supports the work that it's showing. Um, so I put quite a lot of care into the presentation of the board that we had to produce. Our interim show ran throughout February, so I'm a couple of months past the point of when we were setting it up. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what led up to what I produced for my interim show, what I learned from it through making and through presenting and where that left me. So at New Year, I actually went to London with my family. We went to see Hamilton in the West End, which was amazing. And we also went to the Warner Brothers studio tours. Now I have to say, I'm not a huge like Potterhead. Um, I certainly have some opinions about J.K. Rowling, but my younger sister is a big Harry Potter fan and this was kind of her thing that she really wanted to do. So the five of us ended up going and honestly, it was fantastic. It was such an inspiring experience for someone who's quite interested in set design. I was so inspired from seeing the set and production design of that. And then straight away going into then a studio tour for a film, um, I was just like blown away by the amount of kind of inspirations that were going on in my head. One thing in particular that was very influential to me was the set models, small scale models of what the set is planned to look like. I think they're mainly made of paper and card. Obviously they don't want to build a whole set and then find out that there's a problem. They want to have a small scale thing that's maybe only taken a couple of weeks to make um, and that can be easily remade or changed or whatever before they make the final thing. And honestly, these are beautiful. They have so many of them in the studio tours and they're, they're so intricate and so detailed. And as I talked a lot about dioramas in my previous video, I think it's important to say here that I suddenly saw dioramas in a, quite a different way. I think that shift between toy designer and play-based designer maybe, or set designer, which is kind of the direction I was then heading in, really changed my view on what small-scale models can actually do for the design process. Obviously they're not finished pieces the way that I was maybe thinking of dioramas beforehand. They are tools that are used to push the, the large scale design forward. So with that new insight I set about making my own diorama of the Denburn car park which I planned to display at my interim show. I absolutely loved making this model. I found that I learned a lot while making it and obviously, as I said, I'm a couple of months away from the time when I was making it. And already I think I could do it so much better just because of kind of the research and practice that I've had since then. This was my first ever realistic, I guess, 
diorama or um, small scale model that I'd ever made. I kind of threw myself in at the deep end. I think sometimes that's the only way to improve is to actually start doing. Yes, I'd never done it before, so it wasn't the highest quality model ever. I'm still really proud of what I managed to achieve and I did I did actually like my intro model. When I started making it, I had planned to make the whole thing out of white paper, card and foam board, maybe with a couple other materials and textures thrown in there, but the whole thing I wanted to be black and white. So I kind of wanted it to look like an architectural model, that type of thing. I printed off a whole heap of textures like bricks, wood, bamboo, stone, and that was how I was planning to communicate the different textures in the space I was working with. But when I started putting in some natural materials, which I had originally planned to paint white, I thought, what am I actually trying to communicate here? And realized that the, the thing I needed to communicate most was texture, materials, color even taking a space in an urban environment that is underutilized and unused. Obviously, I elaborate a lot more on that in my previous video, but take a space like that in an urban setting and introduce nature in a way that is fun for kids, is playful and can provoke imagination. I definitely need to make this a more realistic, I guess, model rather than an architectural model because it's really important to what I want to communicate in my show. Having said this, the model was mainly made of cardboard, foam board and a fair bit of paper, but there was a lot of natural materials like sand, earth, rocks, and then some, some materials that I bought that are specifically for model making, like fake grass texture. I had been using green felt to show the grass and then I just thought that it was bringing the quality of the whole the model down overall. I invested in some actual fake grass, <laughs> which I think was a good call, honestly, looking at my mo how my model ended up turning out. I would also regulate the scale a lot more. I spent a lot of time converting things on a 1 to something like 83.4 scale just because I didn't plan at the beginning and I just made the model the size I wanted it. I drew a bird's eye view of the car park based on Google Maps. I then scaled it to the scale I wanted my model to be at and then did all the measurements after that. I don't know why I did that honestly, but that you, you live and learn. Like, <laughs> and I certainly did when I was sat there using my Nat5 maths as it was intended. I'll put in a few pictures of my final model as I displayed it. It's a different type of ideating when you have a scale model in front of you and you're maybe, and you're just looking at it and you're going, oh, well, maybe I could put that in. Oh, maybe I could put that in. To me, that's a much more effective and efficient way of working. Um, but obviously that's not always the way I can work. Secondly, I learned a lot about the context of my project from my model and from the feedback I got. I realized how important it was to create a context and create this sort of nature in an urban environment situation. In terms of my space itself, I learned that I need to make sure there is depth in an exhibit. And what I mean by that is that I had focused a lot on my model and I'd focused a lot on my visual language and I thought those worked really well. What I thought could have been improved upon is if I had maybe had different levels, if I had maybe had multiple things going on so that there was a bit more sort of visual interest around my exhibit. And that's something that I want to take forward to degree show and when I consider my design itself, I think that depth is a really important thing to consider. And I think that maybe that's where prototyping and one-to-one -one scale models are really important for me. I'm saying this with a little bit of context, knowing what I know now, not necessarily what I knew at the time of the end of interim show. In addition to presenting to a wider audience, we also got the chance to speak to our external examiner who came up to see our interim show and to talk to us about our project. That was a really helpful and quite inspiring set of conversations that I had with him. This is someone who obviously is examining our work but has a really different perspective to our tutor 
years. Not only have they seen us throughout this year, but they have seen us through the last four years as we've progressed through the art school. And he gave me quite a lot of good pointers. He was interested in tactility, which is definitely something I'm interested in, especially the textural side of that. We live in this technology-driven society and that has so many benefits. But it's interesting to think about the kids of our society who for two years, two probably very influential years of their lives, all of their social life, all of their entertainment, all of their education, and who knows what else was digital. Even post pandemic, a lot of their school is digital. There's been such a massive shift in technology and the emphasis put on different digital skills. So I thought that, that was a really good point that my external examiner brought up about how the pandemic has changed the level of tactility in the world around us. Talking to somebody who doesn't know anything about your project or knows very little about your project can really change the way you see your own work. And I think that's really helpful, although it can be really scary as well. <laughs> From my tutors, the main feedback was how quickly I needed to push my project forward, particularly because my project had seen such a shift in sort of December. I needed to redefine and really strongly scope out the new context for my project. So that's what I did coming off the back of Interim. Going into February, Interim was out the way and in the same week or the same couple of weeks, our final dissertation had been handed in. So all of a sudden I felt like a hundred weights had been lifted off my shoulders and I really could focus on getting my project to the end of the year. I had definitely toyed with the idea of creating like a full-on playground. I love the idea of doing that but I think not only is that probably quite unachievable in the next four to five months, it's also maybe not that relevant to my course and it's going to be really hard to mark and much as I want to make this like a passion project, I also would like to get my degree. There's that. <laughs> I identified that I wanted to design play equipment, large scale play equipment that could be used in a public space. So it was definitely coming off the back of playground but I was no longer doing a landscape. I don't think I ever really was doing a landscape but the idea was in my head for a bit and I had to like shift my perspective off of that. I basically started ideating from woodland which I'd identified as the nature source of the project and I did a lot of ideation from sort of your standard playground equipment like slides, swings, seesaws, roundabouts, climbing frames. I basically took those things and tried to shove them into a kind of foresty context <laughs> and I wasn't that big a fan of stamping a nature theme on your conventional playground equipment. It was definitely veering quite quickly into themed play which I have no problem with but I just felt that there was something jarring about it and um, it wasn't in line with non-prescriptive and imaginative play that I wanted to instill in my design. That was a really big thing for me so I kind of made the decision to step away from that. I also wasn't loving the results I was getting from ideating play equipment from nature. I don't know, it just seemed gimmicky to me and I was just really worried that I was gonna not find something that I loved to design in this project. So yet again, I went back to my research, um, really dug through it, and I kind of had already been leaning towards this word of exploration. It was on my interim board as one of the three words that sort of defined my project. I'd used imagine, explore, and play. Yes, I have my keywords from the beginning of the year, but I think explore was quickly kind of shifting itself in there as a really key concept. Sometimes the design process is like very non-linear. It's hard to tell sometimes, I think, when you're surrounded by influences, when you're you, there's so much research, there's so much ideation and there's so much sort of creativity going on in my head and just around me. It's hard to tell where exactly an idea comes from and I think that that's the beauty of working in such a busy studio space. 
I basically overheard my tutor talking to another student about his project. I won't go into it too much, but basically my friend is creating an object that uses advanced technology to have made it, but he's making it look really old. So it's really jarring and it's like, how could this object be really old but have used modern technology to create it? And that was something that I thought was really interesting. The idea of exploring a crash landed spaceship really appealed to me for whatever reason and I thought I'm gonna ideate based on spaceships. I, I can't explain it, it wasn't to do with my research, it wasn't to do with my keywords, I just wanted to do it and I did one page and thought this is it, this is the direction. I don't want it to be a themed spaceship playground, it was just those are the shapes I want. I found it so much more interesting than the sort of two on the nose nature playground ideas that I'd been having. I don't know, I think I was just in a bit of a design slump at, at that point and then this really brought me out of it. So then came the concern of how is this linking into everything that I have worked towards until this point. That was really easy honestly. I'd already looked at the idea of nature reclaiming built environments and ancient civilizations that had been taken over by forests. I love that. It's to do with exploration, it's like adventurous, visually very interesting, it's in line with what I wanted to do. That really worked. I thought that the idea of maybe a spaceship having crash landed on earth a hundred years ago and then had become overgrown, nature had taken over, it would connect the urban environment to nature more. Having something man-made and having those shapes that are very sort of like industrial and out of man-made materials contrasted with nature I just thought was so interesting. I'd really thought about things like slides and swings and that type of thing but climbing frames were what stood out to me as something that could do multiple things. You can swing on a climbing frame, you can slide down poles of a climbing frame, you can jump around on a climbing frame. It encompasses a lot of these gross motor skills that I was interested in, yet it is one design rather than me making either a custom piece or a collection. I kind of thought if I'm gonna do a climbing frame or as I started calling it a play frame then I can that that can be modular but it can also be it can be a standalone piece. So that appealed to me. I had been thinking a lot about tree climbing and with trees everything is going up the way because they're growing towards the sun but when I was thinking about a spaceship and how you would interact with the spaceship just imagining it I was thinking about climbing through bits, I was thinking about oh well what if this bit did this and what if this bit moved in this way or this bit you could go over, this bit you could go under, this bit you could go through. It seemed so much more dynamic, it seemed so much more complex and interesting for play. Where is it crash landed? At a hillside. In like the countryside or? Yeah countryside. In the countryside. Maybe in the far distance of farm. What is Bob's first thoughts? This is his own spaceship. It's his own one. What, has he crash landed it? Yes. I see. What would your first thought be? How did I even get there? <laughs> the door got stuck in the sand. A lot of controls and one big window at the front. Yeah, a lot of metal. And the okay. food supply. I spoke a lot about supervision in my last video and how kids in the city are going to be more supervised than kids in the countryside and my solution for this, which I thought about while making my interim model, but especially at this point when I was thinking about this kind of spaceship narrative, was hiding places. I thought, you know, if kids have got somewhere to hide, they can be in the same vicinity as their parents, or but they can still be hidden and they can create those social skills and those social connections that can only really be created without an adult there to supervise. I considered the skills and challenges that kids playing in my play frame should and could experience. Gross motor skills were always kind of my focus with this. I thought about running, jumping, climbing, swinging, spinning, sliding, balancing, different types of balancing. One of my inspirations at this point was a conceptual playground called Rimbin. I'll put a link to it in the description so you can 
can kind of see it in a bit more depth but basically this was a conceptual playground developed around the concept of social distancing I would say it's like kind of a sad design because it focuses on allowing kids to play by separating them from other people, putting them in their own like little lily pads, like bubble. But honestly, it's the product of the time that we were living in in the very recent past. I would be a I would be an advocate for play. I would rather kids were able to play in a safe, social distanced way than not play at all. But even still, a lot of the activities that Rimbin produced I found quite interesting. It's interesting to see how kids could interact with each other or engage with different things in a safe social distance way. So obviously my design was not going to be a social distancing friendly play equipment piece but I, it did get me thinking a lot about activities and how kids can engage with things in different ways. I did also have a new context to be working with. My risky play manifesto that I developed at the end of my dissertation really became the base point for if I was doing a good job <laughs> with my design. Some of of the points in that manifesto are that the designer must consider the user group, consider their, their environment, their means, their abilities, but also consider the intended use of different, I guess, designs, different spaces or products, and also consider what level of supervision is reasonable to expect. So forgive me if I'm pronouncing her name wrong, but Heli Nibelong, who I spoke about in my last video as well, has a quote which I believe says something about if every rung on a ladder is the same distance apart, then a child climbing it is not going to pay attention to where they put their feet. I'm not sure what the exact quote is, but um, it's something along those lines. I did some experimentation with some of the shapes and play frame designs that I'd been thinking about and kind of putting them into the idea of a ladder. What would an unconventional ladder look like? What would a ladder look like that wasn't the same distance apart? And I really liked this particular set of shapes. I thought it was kind of, it was interesting to me because it had both organic shapes and inorganic shapes and different angles. I thought that was interesting as well. What I started to realize is that these shapes, you can kind of see in a lot of different things. You can see them in nature, but you can also see them in architecture and infrastructure, I guess. A lot of people said that it looked kind of like Memphis movement, which as soon as they said, I was like, oh yeah right enough. I went on to look at loads of Memphis movement stuff. I basically decided that this was going in the right direction. I was I was heading for something that was larger scale. It was promoting risky play. It was it would evoke imagination, creativity and exploration. It was combining urban and rural concepts. Nature was involved. It was multi-sensory. It was all kind of falling into place. There was definitely a lot I still had to work out but that is what my third and final video in this series is going to be talking about how I resolved my final year project but to wrap up this video I think what I'm going to do is talk through my new redefined brief because there was quite a change in context and it's really important for setting the scene for my end product. I created this risk scale to establish the level of risk and the likelihood that will be present in the outcome of my final project. Starting with the blue end of the spectrum, we have minor incidents that result in no injury. For example, a child falling on some uneven ground, but not actually injuring themselves in the process. Although the child might be shaken, they're not gonna have any physical harm come to them. As this is likely in any playground, it's of course gonna be likely in my design. However, I would say that this type of incident is gonna be more likely in my climbing frame than than in a regular climbing frame. Moving up the scale to the green section, this is a minor incident that does result in a small injury. For example, a bruise or a scrape. This is the most likely form of incident that my climbing frame will be the cause of, as nature is filled with hard surfaces, rough textures, and things that can cause minor bumps and scrapes. The yellow section represents incidents that result in injuries requiring minor first aid. For example, a cut or a twisted ankle. This again will be probably more likely than in a standard playground. This goes back to the research
research backed up by Arathia Luckle, which says that a child is more likely to proceed with caution when presented with what they perceive to be more dangerous equipment. The orange section is the section that I think is most similar to a standardised playground. An incident resulting in short-term infirmity or ailment, for example a broken bone or a concussion. In my design this will be a possibility. It should be no more likely than in a standardised playground. At the top end of the spectrum I would like those two to be less likely than they would be in a standardised playground. The more risk kids are exposed to on a smaller scale, the more likely the children are to learn quicker from those experiences and hopefully that leads to them avoiding much more serious incidents and injuries. So thank you so much for watching part two of my end of year project videos. Um, I hope this made sense and I hope that it was clear. If you're interested in finding out how I finalised my design, please subscribe and stay tuned for part three and any other future videos. Yeah, have a great day. <laughs> See you, bye.